right, welcome to my artist talk about um, my collages that I make. I uh, call it Playing Danger. It actually comes from one random little comment from Friedrich Nietzsche, and thus spoke the Zarathustra, if you've ever heard of him. Um, so it comes from that originally, but I think it's a great way of being light. A little danger, a little play. Um, go ahead. So uh, a lot of my inspiration is, comes from Dada, which is kind of how I got into art, because I used to think you had to have skills and stuff and be dexterous. I never know the words to use for that, but I can't draw very well. So Dada was a great art form because you can use anything really to make art at that point. Um, and they're really famous, for example, photo montage. But the originator is this dude over here, Hugo Ball, weirdo. Um, <laughs> Ended up spending most of his life in a Catholic monastery being a mystic, but uh, he came to Zurich in 1916 or 17 or so and started a movement called the Dada. It was largely a response to World War I and how ridiculous it was. So they basically said, you want to see ridiculous? Okay. And so they were famous for starting riots and things like that. And um, So I'll get a little more into that in a minute, but this is, uh, it was a multimedia type situation in 1916. They had ballet dancers, music, it was kind of everything. Um, and that's kind of a picture of supposedly what, what some of the performances were like. Um, I think a lot of people have heard this guy in some way or another, Duchamp, really famously in 1917, sticks a urinal in the museum and turns it on his side to make it not function and he even signed the wrong name on it, it's not his actual name. So, but the idea of it was not so much just to put a urinal in it, but what did it produce in you to see such a thing in that situation? Um, so this is where some of my, I guess, concepts come into what I was thinking with my collages, which is I'm trying to see what you see um, more than what I see in it. Um, so there's a little bit of chance there you can stick for it. So um, kind of getting you to be in the imagination. Hans Art, famous also Dada's, went on to do other things as well, I think. But um, he, he, what he did was take some squares. He probably lied, by the way. But um, <laughs> he took these squares and just threw them on the ground. And how they landed, that became picture, and it was about chance, and how even with chance, your brain can't help but find things in the chance and put things together. Um, so I kind of take that from Hans Art in a lot of ways. Go ahead, Eric. Um, then actually most of it, the idea of the collage is actually has nothing to do with visual art whatsoever. So the guy in the far, I guess that's your left, Tristan Zara, who wrote a lot of cool manifestos, but he comes up with a way to make poetry. You take something that someone else wrote, cut out all the words, shuffle all the words, and kind of pull them out, and then there's your poem. Um, so that's basically what I did to make all my collages, was I took that idea and did it to, to art pieces. And then you make some stuff. I also try to follow this guy, Andre Breton. He's a surrealist writer, but he was very into automatism, so just go with it without trying to think too much. So it's kind of improvisation all the time. Now the far right is George Luis uh, Borges, who's a writer who writes this really cool thing where he tries to figure out who is the writer. Um, the last line of the thing is, I don't know who's written this. Um, so who is the writer? You know me maybe from listening for now. You might even say my name. But we, we don't know each other in the same way that you might say, like, you know, like you might even say, like, oh, J.P. Rowling. <laughs> you know, I know her. Do you really? Um, but we do that. <laughs> so he kind of asks this question, like, who is the author? And that's kind of something I try to achieve in the artwork as well, to remove myself. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, and then there's a lot of improvisation. I love jazz, um, and there's more or less direction in jazz. On the far left, you have I Got Rhythm, the fourth, first four chords of which is every doo-wop and reggae song you've ever heard. And there's obviously more than four chords in the original song. Anyway, and on this side, which you can't really see very well, is a Cecil Taylor chart for his music, which is there's no bars, there's no staff, there's no chord names, even it's just randomness. But you can kind of predict the head in some ways. So uh, the collages were experiments, but in a way, you can sort of predict what you might get at the end, but at the end, you still don't really know what to do. I don't know what it's going to look like. Um, but that's, that's a big part of it is jazz. I like to kind of just go with it. Um, Kurt Schwitters, I know a, a, a favorite of Travis. Um, of all the, my wife and I spent a long time trying to see if anybody had done a collage like this before, and he's the only person I can really find that's kind of similar, but. He, his is all found stuff, so all the scraps you see that of colors and shapes are actually just random stuff he found on the street, basically. Um, so he made his collages that way. But it's kind of the closest I could find of something like what I've, what I've done. For sure. Go ahead. Um, so now enough about history and stuff, because that's something that maybe bores people. <laughs> I find it interesting. But. Uh, 
how did I do what I did? So I started off just with, for the watercolor ones, just a big piece of paper, and I thought of what colors I might want, and then I think about kind of what, how the colors might play off of each other and things like that. Um, so I tried to make it where this white space, oh, it's my brother in law. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> welcome, brother. Um, so yeah, I had to think about white space. I think about negative space a lot. It helps contrast as well on the colors. But try, you try, I tried my best to uh, also make it so the corners had as many different colors as much. But as you can see, it's impossible to avoid some overlap. But that's kind of the basic level of it, is getting the color there. Go ahead. After that, I take Sumi ink, which, which is kind of an interesting choice, maybe. But I really like using it, because it's really visceral to use Sumi ink. Because you gotta, like grind down the, the ink and stuff. It's kind of fun. What I use it to do is kind of add emphasis, rhythm, and repetition in a lot of a lot of it. It kind of gives a pattern to it, even though it's really just a lot of chaos at the end. But um, I don't know. I now kind of get the one on the far left. It's supposed to be the football playbook or something. That wasn't the intention. But but by adding these marks, it breaks up the colors. It adds sort of character to it, I guess. It kind of gives it something in there. Because trust me, it would look really boring if I just took the colors. But there's one last piece of it that uh, you may not notice. Um, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Um, but I, I also cover all the watercolors in vine afterwards. I kind of go over it. It kind of creates a little atmosphere, a little wispiness to it, and movement, some contrast. Um, I think I also do that just because I love charcoal. <laughs> like rubbing it on there, but it kind of helps out a lot in many ways as well. And that's basically what it takes took to make those up to a certain point. Go ahead, we're going to shift over to the charcoal ones. Um, this is actually where this idea for collage really began, was charcoal. So I took a big piece of charcoal and just kind of went like this. I wish I had video to show you what it looked like, but just kind of went all over the place. I was kind of trying to make it look like a black and white fire, kind of, I think was what I was going for. But then that's not where I obviously ended. Um, after that, I do some other stuff. Um, but what you see on this side is interesting and somewhat similar to how it started off. So it's kind of an interesting experiment. Um, and a lot of people, it's, it's on the ground now, that's okay. Um, but you may not notice at first from far away that, that it is a collage, because the way that happens is the paper is so thin that I write on that it, it just kind of falls flat. Easiest one to glue, actually. <laughs> Lots of glue. I probably went through like a gallon of like that much glue making all this stuff. It's kind of cool. Uh, but in the end, you get a, kind of a cool picture. And of course, there's, there's another charcoal one over there. Um, similar idea, you, you, you kind of can predict a little bit what it might be. And then um, the chalk pastels um, come from, inspired by um, Kandinsky on the top and Mondrian on the bottom. Um, they're, actually, both of these books come from books that you can buy here. I think the Dozberg one over there has the Mondrian in it. Again, I also don't have the Kandinsky anymore. But anyway, really famous artists, and my wife told me not to, call them, to title them this, but I, I wanted to call it either Cutting or Killing Kandinsky. Um, <laughs> But this is actually, if you wanted to be really fidelity to Dada, this is, this is the only truly Dada ones, because I took something that already existed. I had to redraw, of course. But I took something that already existed and two, tore it to pieces, basically, and then put it back together. In fact, Tristan Zara, who came up with that Dada poem method, did it to a speech, I think, in the 1920s in France, where it would have been similar to cutting up, like, I have a dream and doing something like that to it, and it started to riot. Um, so these are the most Dada ones of them all, probably. Taking something that's already there and destroying it. Um, I also wish I had a video of this, but I don't. But what I end up doing is because because I'm trying to achieve that Borges thing where I don't you don't know who the author is, um, I flip the thing upside down when I cut it so that I'm unable to know what I'm cutting to sort of remove myself more and more from any intention being there. Obviously, entirely impossible to completely remove. To, to, to make you and you more and more the person composing what you see. Um, go ahead. I think we're almost done. And then pacing. Um, I say danger. Why? Well, I do play with an exacto knife a lot, and I'm not a very steady hand person, so there's a little danger there. But also, um, it's you start to run out of options at a certain point when you're gluing, or certain colors are maybe not going together well. So you're kind of like second guessing yourself the whole way through, like, is this going to really work? by the end of it. Um, and in the case of the Kandinsky one, I think this is, I ran out of pieces. <laughs> so I had to redraw the thing all over again just to fill in a little bit of space. But 
times. I, I failed a couple of times. In fact, this teal, orange, and silver one, um, I painted, um, I think, two panels, and then I just didn't like the way the sumi ink went on, so I had to start all over again. So that's actually like round two for that. Um, so I didn't fail in the end. And yeah, keep going. And I think this might be this, the last slide, I can't remember, but it's also whoever ends up with these things, um, it's up to you how you hang it. There's no real specific way to hang it. I don't have a particular direction. So here's an example with that particular one where it turned in every direction. Well, it's horizontal <laughs> anyway. Um, and then it kind of makes it look different. For example, I think the way it's up there right now, is that the way, let me see. The way it's up there right now, my wife said it kind of looks like a tiger. You see the ear in the top kind of right hand column, maybe a tail back there and some claws in the front. I don't know if you see it, but. It's kind of interesting. I, I, made a, I made a colleague at work once, one, and she, to this day, says she sees new things all the time. It's kind of cool. But yeah, it's kind of, to remove myself as author, go ahead and hang it as you will. Go ahead. I think there is one more. It's Wittgenstein. I think. Yeah. My favorite philosopher of all time, Ludwig Wittgenstein, not going to go into it, but he, uh, the preface to the only book published in his lifetime, he has a sentence in there where he says, may others come and do better. Um, so really, it's a, if, if you ever want to do this, it's totally fun. It's kind of like a science experiment. A good paper in science, you should be able to know what to do, how to do the experiment they did to verify. So it's no longer mine either. So <laughs> that's, I guess, my best future with grammar and stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for listening. To me. Um, just give us a minute to reset. We're going to have a bit of a conversation between Zach and I just about the process and also about a few things that. Um, we've been kind of discussing since uh, the show had kind of started and just kind of conceptually how this kind of sits in modern times and in contemporary art. So uh, just give us like two or three minutes, you know, talk amongst yourselves. We'll come back to you in just a few. So thank you. And we have a few at the end as well, so don't panic. We'll be here. Cool.